who wouldn't enjoy feeling a little more confident in social situations or feeling more confident at work? Have you ever been told that you're missing a certain something and that's why you're not getting promoted into management or leadership? Well, today I'm going to share five ways that you can build your executive presence, which may be something that you've heard and you've always wondered, well, what the heck is that and how do I develop it? This is Invincible Career, and I'm Larry Cornett. So, I mean, who hasn't wanted to walk into a room with total confidence? I mean, complete confidence. Or give a presentation where everyone trusts your recommendations. Or be given more responsibility because the leadership team knows you can handle it. In other words, Who hasn't wanted a little executive presence? But what is executive presence? Even experienced leaders struggle to define it. They say things like, you'll know it when you see it. You know, I I know it when I see it. It's, uh, It's kind of that automatic, instinctual response that you have to someone who exudes calm confidence and power and seems to be in control of the room. I've witnessed the lack of it holding many people back in their careers. Frequently, when leaders hire me to coach high-potential employees on their teams, they tell me that someone is on their list for a potential management role, but they don't feel the person is ready yet for a few important reasons. Can you guess what one of those reasons is? (laughs) I mean, they will literally say this. They say, well, they lack executive presence. And if you think about it, I believe it really comes down to a few things. One is projecting self-confidence and professionalism. The second one is making tough decisions often on the spot. And that is... That is one of the key differentiators, I would say. Another is taking control and taking ownership when necessary. And then finally, being able to hold your own around other strong personalities. So if you got executive presence, you can hold your own around other strong leaders. And some people refer to that as being able to swim with the sharks. While you may have been told to just fake it till you make it, the reality is that executive presence takes emotional intelligence, strong interpersonal skills, and a willingness to step up and fully leverage your talents. Many years ago, when I was a vice president with Yahoo Search, I was lucky enough to work with a few professional coaches who helped me cultivate that elusive executive presence so many people talk about in the corporate world. I mean, they helped me in so many ways. Uh, and that, were, that probably was the genesis for me wanting to become a coach. It was such a great experience to have someone in my corner for the first time, truly working on my behalf and trying to help me Learn how to become an executive because no one ever really teaches you how to do that. So in this episode, I'm going to share five steps you can take to start building your executive presence. All you need is a base of some self-confidence and an ability to deal with whatever comes your way calmly. Whether you're aiming for CEO someday or just want to feel a little more confident in your next presentation, this advice will help. So let's dive into these strategies. One, convey calm confidence. Two, look and behave like a professional. Three, improve your public speaking. Four, get better at handling conflict. And five, learn how to think on your feet. So I do have a few things that are linked in the newsletter associated with this. There's an article online. So go to newsletter, 
www.invinciblecareer.com. This is five ways to build your executive presence. So let me go ahead and jump into that first one, conveying calm confidence. I always knew something really bad <laughs> was going on at work when my manager's confidence seemed shaken. He wasn't that good at controlling his emotion in the office. Unfortunately, his nervousness and his anxious behavior it was contagious. Before you knew it, the whole team was whispering in the hallways, ducking into everybody's offices and saying, what's going on? Everybody was trying to figure out what was happening and feeling panicked. You know, is it a big reorg? Are we going to have a layoff? Is some project getting canceled? We knew something was going on just from the behavior of our manager. Great leaders know the last thing their teams want to see is them acting worried, stressed, or out of control. The ability to remain calm is an essential skill that helps you, but it also helps others. Practice conveying confidence and calm even when you're not feeling that way. And we don't, we don't always feel that way. Hey, maybe some people do. I don't know. But as a human being, there are times I don't feel confident and calm. But being able to do that, practicing that you're feeling that way, it's one of the first steps you can take to display a stronger executive presence. So first, smile warmly when joining meetings. And that could be in person if you're still... I don't know. Are you still, are you working in a physical office? <laughs> but if you're walking into a meeting or if you're joining a Zoom call, smile. Act as if you are greeting old friends. This is a technique I used in the corporate world, no matter how contentious the meeting might be. Smiling put me in the right frame of mind. It made people f look at me and say, wow, he, he's happy. He's confident. He's not worried. He's not nervous. So the next strategy is to use deeper, slower breaths to relax. And I'm sure you've heard this before, but we often forget to do it in the heat of the moment. And when we get nervous, we tend to retreat into shallow breathing. Our chest feels tight. Our voice goes up a few octaves, and then we feel more stressed. So focus on breathing in slowly through your nose and into your belly. So that kind of that belly breathing, not into your chest, not that shallow breathing. You should actually be able to feel your abdomen expand. So breathe in slowly through your nose, pause and hold your breath just for a second. And then slowly breathe out and take a little longer than you spent breathing in. And when I'm doing this, I kind of do almost like a three count breath in and a five count breath out. So I'll breathe in one, two, three, hold it for a second and then breathe out one, two, three, four, five. And I can actually feel my heart beating when I do that. So I will time that count to my heartbeat. And I can feel my heart beating. One, two, three, pause. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, pause. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, it helps. It helps calm me down. And uh, I think it works for a lot of people. So then finally, take the time you need to respond to questions. This is when people get nervous. We often get anxious in meetings when we feel like we're getting hammered with questions, we feel like we're being put on the spot, and we don't have all the answers. It's, it's okay to sit silently for a second while you gather your thoughts. You don't have to rush into an answer. You don't have to stammer and go, um, 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 let me think, let me think. It's okay. I've watched people with incredible executive presence be asked a question, and this could, by, it could be by a senior executive, by a CEO of the board. I've watched it with reporters. 
and the executive will get the question and they will just look at the person silently for a few seconds. <laughs> they don't say anything. They don't stammer. They don't go, uh, uh, uh. They just sit and look at them and gather their thoughts and then they'll respond. And it's also okay to say, I'll look into that and get back to you by the end of the day. I don't have to have the answer. And that's the big secret. No one has all the answers. But the key is to portray confidence in your ability to get the answers and report back. Control your response, take ownership, and resolve any issues. Get those answers on your timeline. And I had an executive say that to someone. There was a little bit of coaching in the moment where someone was trying to answer and they didn't know what they were saying and they were getting things wrong. And they said, it's okay. <laughs> Luckily, it was, a, it was a good executive, a nice executive. And they said, you know, it's okay not to have the answer. You're not going to always have the answer. Just tell me you'll get the answer and get back to me by tomorrow or end of day. That's okay. That's having executive presence. It doesn't fluster you. And when I first became a manager many, many years ago, I definitely didn't have all the answers. I was just learning how to be a manager. During stressful meetings, and I was in many, many stressful meetings, I felt very anxious on the inside. My heart would be racing. However, I did focus on externally displaying calm confidence at all times. I forced myself to, and apparently it worked. One of my employees said to me, you're always so calm in every meeting, even when people are arguing. Nothing seems to bother you. I thought to myself, well, good. <laughs> I'm glad it's working. And they think I'm calm. I'm super stressed, but my team doesn't need to see that. And that's the key. You can be stressed. We all get stressed. But you don't have to let it come out. So try these tips next time you start feeling stressed in a meeting. Remember to smile and be friendly. Show that you're in control. Show that you're not nervous. You're not worried. You're not fearful. Slow down your breathing and focus on centering yourself. Take time to listen and reflect. Answer when you're ready and you'll be heard. Conveying a sense of confidence and calm begins with owning how you respond. Start with controlling yourself and you'll be on the path to genuine executive presence. Number two, look and behave like a professional. Are you familiar with the saying, dress for the job you want, not the one you have? When it comes to cultivating your executive presence, it goes one step further. Behave as if you are in the job you want to. And I know the advice of look and behave like a professional may sound rather obvious. Maybe you find it insulting. Maybe it bothers you. It's like, what do you mean by professional? What kind of professional? Where do I even begin? What does it mean? And it depends on your workplace. Looking like a professional, like an executive, is very different in an East Coast financial company and a West Coast software company. You know, it's very different on a construction site and in a lawyer's office. So understand your environment. And if you want to be a rebel, be a rebel, but just realize, <laughs> take a look up the chain. And if all the executives, if they're in positions that you want and they're looking and behaving a certain way, you might want to take note. If you don't like playing the game, build your own playground. I tell people this all the time. You don't have to play this game. Get out, build your own company, do your own thing, find a company that fits you better. But if you're going to try to stay in a company with a certain type of culture and you want to move up and you're complaining and you're worried and upset that you're not getting promoted, learn how to play their game or get out. 
So if you want to play the game, the good news is the answer is probably right in front of you. Someone in your professional circle, whether that's in the academic world or the corporate world, is operating at a level you admire. They also have the executive presence you desire. This person could be your model for how you want to look and behave to cultivate your executive presence. So first, identify someone you view as a career hero. And I've talked about a career hero before. You have to find somebody reasonable, somebody that emulates what you want to be in the role that you want to pursue. Maybe they already have that job, the job that you want. Or they're operating in a more senior role on your current career path. They're a little higher on the career ladder. The key is to choose someone who is not only in a role you admire, but also behaves like the professional you want to be. They have that desirable executive presence. And that's important because we've all watched a variety of executives and seen their behavior. And there are going to be some executives you're like, I don't ever want to be like that person. I can't stand that person. I think they're rude. They're controlling. They're authoritarian. It's not who I'm going to be. That's not me. But pay attention and you will notice an executive who is someone you admire and respect. And you're looking at their behavior and saying, that is more like who I am. That's my personality. So next, pay attention to your hero in meetings. If you have the opportunity or if you need to watch them on video, watch them doing interviews with the press or whatever it is, take notes. What is it that she does that conveys professionalism? How does she behave? I had a career hero at one of my past companies. I thought he was on the path to executive greatness, and I was right. He did go straight to the top. He really did. And I paid attention to everything he did. How he walked into meetings, where he sat. He was very careful about that. How he ran meetings. Even the expressions on his face when others were talking and presenting. And how he responded to questions. How he managed the media. And then finally, pay attention to your hero's style. Remember, dress for the job you want. Like it or not, your appearance does impact your executive presence. A great deal of how you are perceived will indeed be how you speak and behave. But people can't help but notice your appearance too, especially as you first join a meeting and before you even begin speaking. They're just looking at you. They don't know how you're going to behave. They don't know how you speak. Now, you don't have to become a carbon copy of someone else and you shouldn't. But your career hero gives you a sense of how a successful professional with executive presence looks and behaves. Third strategy, improve your public speaking. I'm sure you're getting tired of hearing me say this, but wow, everybody keeps, I shouldn't say that. Everybody's not ignoring this. Some people are ignoring this. They think and they can work around it, but it is a career limiting move if you are not comfortable with public speaking. And I wouldn't be surprised if one of you listening to this isn't because approximately 20 million people in the U.S. alone are struggling with a fear of public speaking. And I used to be one of those people. I've talked about that. However, can you picture a single person with a strong executive presence who is uncomfortable speaking in front of people? And I would guess not. Overcoming my fear of public speaking has been probably the number one thing that helped me advance my career. It made me comfortable with my leadership duties. I, I was comfortable taking the stage. And I was able to pitch investors for my startup. If you want to strengthen your executive presence, invest in your public speaking skills. First, make time for deep preparation to boost your confidence when you speak. So much of feeling comfortable speaking is about presentation, about preparation for your presentation. Nancy Duarte, who's an excellent presenter and TED speaker, you can look her up on uh, the TED Talks. 
She estimates that you should expect to rehearse at least one hour per minute of your presentation. And I'm sure that sounds extreme. But I did exactly that to prepare for a talk at a conference in Australia. This was pre-COVID. Boy, I miss those days, being able to actually go to a physical conference. (laughs) But I wanted to make sure that I, I nailed my presence on stage. So guess how much time I spent rehearsing my talk? Over 52 hours. I spent about 52 hours of practice and rehearsal over several months for that one hour presentation. Next, if you're an introvert like me, create a speaking persona. I learned to think of my public speaking as a performance, and I visualized my talking on stage as acting. I just pretended that I was acting. And it's rather liberating. This helped me overcome being inwardly focused on my anxiety while speaking to the audience. Instead, I was someone else. I pretend to be someone else. Someone who loved public speaking. And then finally, find your friendly fans. When you first start speaking, you face this imposing sea of faces. I mean, it can be overwhelming, whether that's on stage or Zoom. You know, some of us are in Zoom meetings with dozens of people, sometimes hundreds of people. The key is to find the faces of your friendly fans. So rather than feeling like you're speaking to a crowd, you have a series of one-on-one conversations throughout your talk. And there are always a few people who are smiling and nodding as you speak. A few. Maybe everybody. Maybe you're one of those people. With me, it's a few. So present to them. That will boost your confidence. Becoming a talented public speaker requires a lot of preparation and practice. But that investment is well worth it for your career and developing your executive presence. Four, get better at handling conflict. Who wouldn't want a workplace that is 100% free of anger and conflict and misunderstandings? We all would. And while we're making wishes, I would also like a unicorn pony. That would be wonderful. I've always been impressed by the people in these meetings who can resolve conflict with ease. They can diffuse a volatile situation and help everyone reach a resolution. I mean, conflict is a part of life, and it will occur in your workplace sooner or later. Sometimes the issues will be with your coworkers. Sometimes it might be with your boss. But have you noticed that the people with executive presence never let the conflict shake them? I mean, perhaps some people are born with nerves of steel. But I know that you can develop your conflict resolution skills. First, challenge your starting assumptions. Thinking the worst of someone else and playing through disaster scenarios in your mind won't guide you to a positive outcome. Pierre Omidyar founded eBay in 1995 on the premise that people are basically good. That's what he would say. People are basically good. And that belief also influenced our approach to workplace conflict in the company. So when you're dealing with an issue with your coworker, start with the assumption that the other person is a good person. Assume they are a rational human being. Don't assume the worst. Next, use radical candor. And I don't know if you've heard of that before. I've mentioned it before. I linked uh, the book that talks about radical candor. It's in the newsletter for this. If you go to newsletter.invinciblecareer.com and go to this episode. Kim Scott, who, uh, who wrote the book, She says, radical candor really just means saying what you think while also giving a damn about the person you're saying it to. Operate with essential integrity, authentic communication, and constructive negotiation. Be open and honest and seek mutual success. And speaking of success, finally, you should seek shared goals. 
Discussing common goals with someone is one of the most effective techniques I've used for handling conflict. I often find we get too focused on the lower level goal, lower level goals of your team and of ourselves. You know, you're saying, I want X, but you want Y, and we can't get to resolution. So it helps to move the conversation up a level, move it up to higher level shared goals that are good for the entire organization or good for the company. So you share those goals. Stop talking about the goals at the lower level. You want to metaphorically sit on the same side of the table and face an issue together. Reach mutual agreement on the shared goals and focus on working together on a solution that lets you achieve them. So the next time you're facing conflict at work, Ask yourself, how would someone with an executive presence handle this situation? Assume the best of the other person. Use radical candor to discuss the issues. And seek those shared goals that will enable both parties to succeed. And then finally, the last strategy. Learn how to think on your feet. This is a big one. This is good for everybody. It's really good for executive presence. I mean, real life is messy and it's chaotic. But you don't have to let that chaos rub off on how you behave. People with executive presence rarely seem flustered. So first, always prepare ahead of time. Never come into a meeting cold. If you can avoid it, don't get dropped into a meeting cold or just say, oh, I'll just wing it and see what happens. And if you take control of your calendar, which is something I recommend all the time, that's something I've been working on with premium subscribers this year. It's one of the, the exercises we did earlier this year was controlling your calendar. Blocking off time, making time to be ready. You know, maybe having some time before a meeting to prepare. So if you do that, you'll know what's coming up. When you control your calendar, you know what your next day is going to be. And you can get ready for it. So do your research on the topic and the issues. Research the players in the meeting too. So if you don't know everyone in the meeting, do a little research. And if you're smart, you've already met with the key players ahead of time to build the alliances you need. This is something I learned as a leader and definitely as an executive. People did not go into important meetings and talk about something for the very first time. (laughs) They had already met with each of the key players, the attendees, ahead of time, one-on-one, and try to get buy-in and support for their initiative. If it sounds like politics, it is. Build those alliances. Makes your meeting a lot easier. Next, expect the unexpected. Practice answering expected questions and some unexpected ones. And I do this with my, my clients who are preparing for job interviews. There's the usual questions you should expect. Tell me about yourself. What did you do in your last role? Why are you looking for a job? But there's unexpected questions too. What would your boss say about you? Why should I not hire you? So practice some of those. Practice answering questions that might throw you for a loop. I mean, nothing in a live meeting is going to be identical to your rehearsal. But practicing your answers makes it easier to improv a little bit later. And that's what meetings feel like sometimes. It feels like an improv act. (laughs) People with executive presence know what they want to say and they control the flow of the conversation. And I've seen that time and again. They answer the question they wish they had been asked, not the question they were actually asked. And finally, it's okay to not have all the answers on the spot. I talked about this. You don't have to have the answer to every question. Even some of the top executives I worked with. These are people like senior vice presidents. They didn't have all the answers on the spot, but they took ownership and they were accountable. And they always said, I don't know, but I will find out and I'll get back to you. So the big takeaway I want to kind of point out is if you want to be a leader, behave like a leader before you're a leader. Some people think that you somehow magically acquire executive presence once you become a senior leader or an executive. It just, it just happens. 
It just happens. But I bet you know a few leaders who actually don't have it. And you're probably wondering, how did they get promoted? I'm pretty sure you also know a few individual contributors, people who aren't managers, who aren't leaders, but they exude executive presence. They do this even though they don't have very much official authority or they don't even have a team to kind of back it up. Authentic leadership is expressed through your actions and words, not your title. Don't wait for some promotion to grant you self-confidence and presence. Start building it for yourself right now. No matter what path your career takes, having a strong executive presence will serve you well. After participating in countless performance review sessions, calibration activities, and promotion decision-making sessions, I know that a lack of executive presence can hold someone back. Now, it might not hurt you for lower-level promotions, but it will be noticed and discussed during promotion decisions for senior leadership positions. It absolutely will. More than once, I recall a manager putting someone up for a promotion and then having it shot down by one of their peers. They'd say something like, them? No. No, they aren't ready for a director-level role. They're not confident enough. They don't even act like a leader. Whether it's fair or not, impressions have an impact. If people don't see you as a leader, they may not treat you like a leader. If you want it, step up and be it. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to learn more about me and how I could potentially help you, check out InvincibleCareer.com. If you're interested in being notified about upcoming releases of my podcast episodes, please subscribe. And I would certainly appreciate a rating review if you could make the time for that. Thank you. Until next time, I wish you the best of luck in becoming an opportunity magnet for the best things in life.